We're going to close out our study of the book of Colossians. So if you'll take your Bibles, please, and join me in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, as we take a look at this last chapter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. Uh, we have a few Bibles. If you didn't bring one, so uh, all you need to do is raise a hand, and the ushers, as they come down the aisles, will hand you a Bible. And uh, you can make your way to Colossians chapter 4. Only 18 verses, but we're going to close out this book together tonight. And then next week, read ahead because we'll be on to 1 Thessalonians. And 1 Thessalonians has a lot to say about the second coming of Christ. So it's a very timely book for us. Um, we had the, do we have the blood moon today? Don't, don't read too much into that. But anyway, that's, the Bible talks about that too. So anyway, but we'll get into 1 Thessalonians next week. For tonight, Colossians chapter 4, let's first pause and have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your love and your grace in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your instruction to us, even in this generation. And I pray that as we look at this closing chapter of Colossians, that we would not look at this as some ancient letter, but we would look at it as timeless truth that you've given unto us, even for our day, even for this generation. And we thank you, Lord, for just who you are. And if you didn't do another thing for us, you've already done more than enough. And we just thank you and give you praise, glory, and honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. So we started this book a few weeks ago, and now we're bringing this book to a conclusion here, the book of Colossians. Colossae was a city in what is modern Turkey. Paul wrote this letter around A.D. 60 to A.D. 61 or 62. While he was imprisoned in Rome, you're going to see a reference to his imprisonment here as he closes out this letter. Just a reminder to us that he's writing to some people he's never met. The book of Colossians, this letter indicates to us as he writes this that he has never been to Colossae to plant this church. Many of the letters that Paul writes is a letter to encourage one of the churches that he personally was a part of planting. Colossians is not one of those. He did not plant the church at Colossae, but he is writing to these people, brothers and sisters whom he loves. He's heard about them by way of reputation. Their pastor, Epaphras, has come and visited Paul in prison. Epaphras does not go back to Colossae at the end of this letter. Paul is going to mention that he's delivering this letter through another guy by the name of Tychicus. And so what happens to Epaphras, the pastor, some speculate he actually got in prison too. And so that's why he didn't return with this letter in hand. And chapter 4, Paul brings these concluding remarks, his final words of instruction to this church at Colossae that has been dealing with a variety of things, primarily dealing with a combination of heresies, a combination of Greek and Oriental uh, and um, uh, spiritual mysticism that now he is bringing to a close here with chapter 4. And what we'll notice here in the first few uh, verses of chapter 4 is that Paul's final instructions have to do with our communication with God. Uh, that's what we commonly call prayer. That's verses 2 to 4. And then he's going to also give instruction about our communication with others in verses 5 and 6. And that's what we commonly call witness, our witness, our testimony. So what I'd like to do is kind of uh, tackle this fourth chapter out of order. I want to come back to these first few verses and spend the majority of our time looking at verses 1 through 6. But if you'll notice in your Bibles, verse 7 through the end of the chapter deal with what is subtitled in my Bible, the final greetings. And what Paul is going to do here is he's going to give closing remarks to or about nine specific people by name. So what I'd like us to do is first look at this last section and just kind of cover the, the final greetings as he mentions different people, and then we'll come back, we'll spend the majority of our time between uh, verses one through six. So if you'll, if you'll jump straight ahead to verse seven, you'll see the first of nine people mentioned here, Tychicus. 
And uh, he says t about Tychicus that he will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and faithful servant in the Lord. So Tychicus is the one who hand delivers this letter that Paul pens from prison in Rome. Tychicus is the one who delivers this to the church at Colossae. And so Paul commends him to the church saying that he's a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. He says in verse eight, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus. Now, here's another person that Paul mentions. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. Now, you might uh, notice that Onesimus is a familiar name to some of you who also know uh, your Bibles because Onesimus is mentioned in the book of Philemon. And what we come to find, this is the same Onesimus. What we come to find out when we get to Philemon is that Onesimus is a slave. Now, during the first century Roman Empire, there were an estimated three, some say as many as six million slaves during the first century of the Roman Empire. Onesimus is one of them. And Onesimus runs away from his master and finds Paul. We don't know how he finds him. We don't even know how he learned about him. But he makes his way to Paul in prison there in Rome. And in the course of Onesimus, at some point, visiting and encountering with Paul, Onesimus gets saved. Paul will write the church, uh, will rather write the letter uh, to Philemon instructing him to take back Onesimus. That's this same guy. What I love about this, and I only mention all that background so you can appreciate how Paul refers to Onesimus there. Notice again in verse 9, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. He does not refer to him as a slave, though he is one. Paul refers to him as he's a faithful and dear brother who is one of you. And I made mention last week that in chapter 3, at the close of chapter 3, one of Paul's instructions to uh, the people of his day was in regards to the conduct of slaves in relation to their masters. In fact, chapter 4 here begins with an exhortation to masters. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. I'm talking about the Lord. And as I mentioned last week, and I'll just point out again today, sometimes you can read your Bibles and you can see mentions of slavery and masters and why is Paul giving instruction here to slaves in terms of their conduct? Shouldn't he be outraged that there even is slavery? And shouldn't the Bible be more specifically, intentionally, directly addressing the inhumanity of slavery? And here's, and here's instead the approach that the New Testament primarily takes in regards to slavery. It is an issue that is incompatible with Christianity, for sure. In fact, in, earlier in chapter three, uh, he talks about how um, in verse 11, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul will write similar language in Galatians chapter three. He talks about there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, for we are all one in Christ. And the way that they addressed it in the New Testament times was, if we can elevate every person and recognizing that every person, regardless of what circumstance they find themselves in, is equal in the eyes of God, valuable in the eyes of God, and important in the eyes of God, we can dismantle something like slavery. That's actually what happened. When you look historically at slavery, and even in America's own history and Great Britain's own history, what started in Great Britain and eventually moved over to America was initiated because Christians rose up and realized and began to apply what Scripture teaches in terms of the equality of all human beings, no matter of race, creed, color, nationality, ethnicity. And when you begin to preach an elevated message that all are equal in the eyes of, of God, and people begin to realize that, recognize it, and accept it, it dismantles, you see, it dismantles the whole structure of slavery. And so that's what happened, and that's what Paul, basically what Paul's doing is saying, listen, if this is the circumstance you find yourself in, here's how you can make the best of it. 
But don't misread this to think that it's actually condoning slavery. He renounces it and speaks out against it, but gives advice in the context of the time saying, listen, if this is the situation and you're a part of this, you know, what the Roman government has legalized and, and you're a part of either end of it, you need to recognize that you are serving as unto the Lord or you are leading as if you are pleasing your master in heaven, but eventually it's Christianity that dismantled the inhumanity of slavery because God elevates every human being as equal in the eyes of God. That Jesus died for all and that there is no one nation, race, people, ethnicity greater than or less than another. We are all equal and equally loved in the eyes of God. And so Paul addresses Onesimus here as a faithful and dear brother who is one of you he says to the people of Colossae. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. In verse 10, he says, my fellow prisoner uh, Aristarchus, he mentions Aristarchus. Uh, Aristarchus is mentioned three times in the book of Acts. We find out in the book of Acts that Aristarchus is one of uh, Paul's traveling companions on his third missionary journey. So he, he commends my fellow prisoner Aristarchus. So obviously that means Aristarchus is in prison with Paul. He sends you his greetings as does Mark the cousin of Barnabas. Now, if you have a King James, it'll, it'll say the, the niece. It speaks of Barnabas as the, uh, uh, or Mark, rather, as the son of Barnabas' sister. So some translations say that he is the uh, nephew. Did I say niece? That he's the nephew, uh, and others uh, say that he is the cousin. You know, it, it doesn't corrupt the gospel. Don't get hung up on it. People are like, well, is he, this is an error in the Bible. So is, is he the nephew or is, is he the cousin? It's not going to be a salvation issue, friends. Move on. <laughs> but this is the same Mark. This is the, um, this is the same Mark as the one who was used by the Lord to pen the gospel of Mark. This is John Mark. Now, now Mark was not one of Jesus' disciples. He was too young. He is mentioned by inference in the gospels uh, as being around 12 years of age. Uh, and, and yet he's later someone that the Lord uses to write some history with regard to the gospel of Mark. Now, um, Paul ends up having a disagreement with Barnabas about Mark because John Mark at times shows that he's timid and shows that he is at times scared, which, you know, look, cut the guy some grace. A first century Roman Empire, you go around saying you're a Christian. It's not like today. And what's the worst that's going to happen to you? Your boss comes to you and says, hey, don't be talking about your Christianity and get your Bible off your desk. Oh, big deal. If you live in the first century, here's what could happen to you. Off with your head. That's what could happen to you. So John Mark actually realizes, like, I could die for this. I could die for being a Christian. Gets a little timid. And Paul says, you're, you're a mamsy. I want nothing to do with, that's the message translation. You're a mamsy and I want nothing to do with you. And so he says to Barnabas, get rid of your nephew or cousin or whatever you want to call him. Because he's a hindrance to the gospel. Barnabas ends up separating from Paul and goes off and does his own missionary journey. But this is now 12 years later. And... Paul has softened in regards to his view of Mark. And in fact, in another five years, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, he's, he's actually going to commend, he's going to say that Mark is, uh, my, is helpful in my ministry. So there's a reconciliation there. But this is that same John Mark. Uh, he's, he adds there in verse 10, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Verse 11 Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. Now, please be aware that, you know, that Jesus is a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew name, right? Yahashua, Yeshua is, is the name that Jesus was called in Hebrew. But Jesus was a common name. And so, you know, as Paul mentions Jesus here, this is not, a, of course, the Jesus of the Gospels. This is a Jesus who's also known as Justice. I think Paul throws that in there just so that, you know, we're sure to know. I mean, this is 62 AD. Jesus ascended back into heaven around 33 AD. So this is certainly not the same one, but it's a popular name. I was having conversation. I do some chaplaincy work with the sheriff's department. I was having a conversation with the deputy just last week. And he said, he said, just a very weird encounter happened where he had to arrest someone on Christmas Eve. He was Hispanic and his name was Jesus, but it was spelled like Jesus. And he said, I had to fill out my report saying that I arrested Jesus on Christmas Eve. 
He said, it just, it sounded wrong all the way around. It's just a common name, but this is that, he mentions Jesus here, called Justice, sends his greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, and this is a reference to that, that pastor, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor. Now this is the same Luke who was, we have a gospel named after him, the gospel of Luke. Luke was also the one who was inspired by the Lord to write the book of Acts. That's this same guy. And Paul's the one who lets us know that he's, that he's a doctor, he's, he's a physician. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, who was also a traveling companion of Paul's, by the way, and Damas send greetings. Now, circle Damas' name there because we read of him again in Paul's last letter, 2 Timothy, just before Paul is uh, beheaded for his faith, before he's martyred for his faith. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there's a very sad commentary about Damas. Uh, Paul writes that Damas has deserted us because he loved the world. That's the same guy. And so Damas is mentioned here as part of Paul's friends and fellow laborers of the gospel. But by the time you get to 2 Timothy, about five years later, this guy is not only not a companion of Paul's, but Paul says that he is even deserted the Lord, and he's following the world. So a sad commentary on him. In verse 15, he says, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Now, uh, some of your translations say, and to the church in his house. There's, there's a little discrepancy here over, over Nympha's name, too, and whether, you know, it's kind of like there are certain names that are can go in, in, you know, either masculine or, or feminine, you know, like the name Pat uh, can be a, a man's name or a woman's name. And so some translations have translated it as her, some say his. Again, it's not a salvation issue, friends. Don't trip up over it. But I, I pointed out, because as I'm reading it, some of you might have a, a, a new King James or King James. You're like, wait, I thought it says his house. If you have ESV or NIV, like I'm reading, friends, it says her house. Okay, so let's move on from Nympha. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Now that could either be a reference to an unknown letter, because we don't have a letter to the Laodiceans in our Bibles, or some Bible scholars believe that he's referring to the letter that he sent to the church at Ephesus, that it actually could be the church of, of, uh, of Ephesus, Ephesians. That Paul wrote, it was very typical in that day that if, if Paul wrote a letter to a particular church, that neighboring churches, Laodicea, Hierapolis, Colossae, those were all located in the same region of, of the province of Asia Minor or Turkey on a map today. And it's possible that they're just passing these letters around and that that's what he's referring to. Otherwise, we don't have a letter in our Bibles to the Laodiceans. And then in verse 17, he says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Some scholars believe that Archippus may have been the pastor of the church at Laodicea, and Paul is exhorting him, like, just hang in there, complete the work that you have received in the Lord. And then Paul says in the last verse, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, remember my chains, and grace be with you. So that's that reference, his chains, to the fact that he's imprisoned in Rome. In the time we have left, I want us to go back up to the beginning of chapter 4, and uh, for us to take to heart some of Paul's closing instructions here as it relates to our communication with God, which we would call prayer, and our communication with one another, which we would call our witness. If you'll notice in verse 2, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. 
Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So you see here that between verses 2, 3, and 4, he emphasizes prayer. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. He even then says, while you're at it, in verse 3, pray for us too. And then he even gets specific in verse 4 how, how they can proclaim, not only that, uh, pray for them, not only that, that Paul would proclaim the mystery of Christ, but he says in verse 4, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as, as I should. So there's this emphasis in the first part of chapter 4 on prayer. And what I wanted to do was just kind of uh, accumulate a few different verses in the Bible that speak about prayer as just some general reminders about the importance of prayer. Look, I'm not going to say anything new that hasn't already been written on this subject. There is more in, in Christian writings on the topic of prayer than any other topic among doctrine or Christian faith. There's more written on the topic of prayer. But as I've said before, uh, there might be a lot written on the topic of prayer. But I don't think as many of us are praying as much as we should. A lot of information out there, and what I'm about to share with you probably won't be anything new, but just a reminder to us that we need to be, as Paul exhorts the church at Colossae, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. So what I'm going to share first are three different verses, uh, actually four, but three main points that um, speak to me about prayer. I'm sure that there are many verses that speak to you about prayer, but I'm the one that has the pulpit, so you're going to hear mine. And you're, hap you're, you're welcome to share yours with me later, but you're going to get the ones that, that come to me and the ones that have spoken to me over the years. And then I'm going to also give you five important truths about prayer as it relates to what God thinks of it when we pray. So the first ver one of the first verses that comes to my mind is this. It's Luke 11, verse 1. And it is when Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And it is in that setting that Jesus teaches them what has commonly been referred to as the Lord's Prayer. I personally don't think that the Lord's Prayer was ever intended by the Lord to be recited as a rote prayer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think and many Christians have put the Lord's Prayer to memory, and I think it sounds beautiful, and, and, and it's, it's a wonderful prayer to pray, but I don't know that that was necessarily our Lord's original intent. I want you to go around reciting this prayer, reciting this prayer, reciting this prayer. Because how many of us understand that you can go around reciting something long enough and it loses its meaning? I think what Jesus intended in the Lord, what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, is a model. Here is a model of how to pray. You know, start out with praise, you move into the will of God, you talk about your basic needs, and then you ask for the kingdom of God to come and to be established. And that doesn't mean necessarily the millennial reign, I think it just means the rule and reign of Christ in your life as king. But it's a beautiful model, and you can, you can look at the Lord's Prayer, it's in Matthew 6, it's in Luke 11, and just kind of see a great outline for the elements to be included in prayer. What it says to me, though, in, in the words of the disciples when they asked Jesus in, in Luke 11, 1, teach us to pray, is this first point, that prayer is a discipline. It will not come naturally or conveniently to us. If, if it came naturally or conveniently, they wouldn't have said teach us. They understood that their prayer life was not what it should be, and they often saw Jesus model prayer, and because of his example, they just said to him, teach us to pray. We don't know how to do this. We don't know how to do this. So whenever you see in the Bible some directive or some instruction, uh, it's, it's, it's often because it doesn't come naturally to us. It doesn't come conveniently to us. And I think prayer is one of those things. Now, prayer will come naturally and conveniently to us when, when we're in a mess, amen? When you're in trouble, or something is going wrong in your life, or you got terrible news, or you're in, you know, you're in, you're tied up with fear, or some, then people pray. You know the old saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. So when bombs are going off and bullets are flying around you, you're going to develop a prayer life quick. 
When that airplane starts to hit some air pockets, you're praying fast. Nobody has to tell you. Teach me to pray. No, you're just praying. But what I'm speaking of is just the daily discipline, you know, outside of when those kind of fearful things or life, you know, throws us a curveball and then all of a sudden we start praying more. I'm just talking about, the, you know, the everyday kind of discipline of developing a prayer life. And I think that when Jesus' disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray, it is indicative of where most of us are on this topic. That unless we discipline ourselves, it won't come naturally and it won't come conveniently. Prayer is a discipline. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was with his disciples just before Jesus was arrested, betrayed, arrested, and crucified, and he has his disciples there. Now it's absent Judas. Judas is gone now because he's gone to gather up the Roman soldiers to betray Jesus. So he has his 11 there. And, he, and the Bible says that he takes Peter, James, and John off a little bit further from the others uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane where he can pray. And then he goes a little bit further from them. And at different times, Jesus comes back to his disciples and he says, could you not tarry one hour? He sees them sleeping. And he says, could you not, King James says, could you not tarry? Could you not wait? Could you not pray? Could you not be watching for one hour? Now that speaks to me because Jesus made one hour sound like that's a real minimal time that you should be praying every day. Could you not tarry? Could you not wait? Could you not pray just even one hour? But he found them sleeping and it's in that same conversation where Jesus says to them, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Okay, our spirit is willing to pray. We have good intentions about prayer, but our flesh is weak. And there are a lot of things that compete with our time and attention in regards to prayer. So we, we are busy doing a lot of things. Those, a lot of things compete with our communion with God. Those things compete with our attention. We become preoccupied by, by everything else instead of the Lord. And that's just the nature of our flesh. That's what comes more conveniently. That's what comes more naturally is, is busyness and preoccupation with the cares and concerns of this world. And it's only when the cares and concerns of this world reach a point where we're in fear or frustrated that then we pray. But prayer should be the first objective, not the last resort. We should learn to start our day with prayer. How many of you could honestly testify that when you start your day with prayer, you noticed that generally speaking, your day tends to go better when you start your day with prayer. Let me see hands, come on, just a bit, yeah, amen. And so, but, and how many of you would also say that you've noticed at different times when you're in a rush, you're trying to get out the door and you're doing this and you don't pray in the mornings, you also become keenly aware that your day doesn't go as well, amen, yes? Okay, so uh, it's true. And it takes that kind of discipline. Now, I don't want to be legalistic about this discussion of prayer. It's not that you have to pray in the morning. I'm just recommending to you, and you, you saw the hands, if you're not a morning prayer, that it, it tends to help set the tone and pace of your day when you can start it with prayer. You say, well, I have to get up really early, and, you know, and, and I got kids that get up really early. Okay, well, then get up earlier. All I'm saying is, I mean, we have to carve out the time and do what it takes to really have that special, quiet communion with God. But it is, again, not gonna be something that will naturally happen. It has to be intentional. It's a discipline of our faith to pray. Oswald Chambers said, quote, we tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. You even see Jesus model this in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 35. You don't need to turn, but it's one of the most challenging verses in the Bible for me. And especially, I don't mean to make this about me, but being in pastoral ministry, there's a scene in Mark, chapter 1, where Jesus, it says, is in Capernaum, and he literally, it says, it spends all night ministering to people who were sick and diseased, all night long. It says that everybody was bringing the sick and diseased to Jesus in Capernaum. And it says in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, that he ministers them all night long. And then Mark 1, 35, it says, early the next morning, before the sun rose, Jesus left the home where he was staying and went to a solitary place where he could pray. 
I mean, he had just poured himself out completely, ministering to all the sick and diseased and, and sharing truth with people, and, and yet he doesn't sleep in. He gets up early the next morning, even before the sun rises, Mark 1.35, and he goes off to a solitary place where he can pray. Now, if Jesus, if the Son of God had unlimited resources tapped into the power of his Father in heaven, and he saw the need to get up in the morning before sun rose and to get into a solitary place and pray, how much more do I need to pray? How much more do you need to pray? But it's a discipline. The Lord teaches us to pray. It will not come naturally or conveniently. Here's another verse that comes to mind in regards to prayer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray continually. Some of your translations say, pray without ceasing. And I think that's a good reminder, and this is point number two, prayer is a disposition, not just a destination. Now, look, there are many examples in the Bible where it speaks of prayer like a destination. In, in Acts chapter 16, it, it talks about how Paul went to the place, the place of prayer, uh, I, I just mentioned Mark 135, Jesus went to a solitary place where he could pray. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, I think it's verse 10, where it talks about uh, when you pray, go into your, your prayer closet, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and the one who sees in secret will reward you. And so it even speaks about a place of prayer. There are definitely places for prayer. If you ever saw the movie War Room, which is an awesome movie, you know how she had that, that room in her house where she would go and, and pray. And prayer is, you know, a it's a place where you can make as a destination. I'm going to go to my place of prayer. But it is also a disposition because when Paul writes there in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually or pray without ceasing, you can pray anywhere, anytime. You can pray as you're driving to work. You can pray as you're driving home from work. And I don't, I don't just mean the kind of prayers like, oh, this traffic, Lord, get these people. I don't mean that kind of prayer. I mean, you know, just you're, you're praying to work, you're praying from work, you're praying when you have some downtime, you're praying when you're mowing the lawn, you're praying when you're washing your car, you're praying when you're shoveling snow. You're, and you're just different times where you just have some alone time. You can be praying. Some of the best times of prayer I've had are in the shower when I was like, nobody's around and it's just, you know, just that soothing hot water on your neck and you're just like giving your day to the Lord. Just, I mean, prayer can happen any place, any time. Pray continuously. Pray without ceasing. It doesn't have to be long, protracted, you know, these, you know, uh, uh, lengthy prayers. It can just be you're constantly just communing and having conversation with God. I mean, that's what, that's what prayer is. But please, let's remind ourselves, conversation is a two-way communication path. Because conversation is not just talking, it's also listening. Sometimes I think to myself when I hear people say, you know, God doesn't speak to me. I, I pray, I pray, I pray, and, I, and God doesn't speak to me. That's because you're so busy talking, he can't get a word in edgewise. How about you just stop yapping long enough in your prayer closet or wherever you are driving or doing whatever to just make prayer a time of just listening. Just be still before the Lord and know that he is God. Sometimes our prayers amount to just a bunch of requests. Lord, I want this. I need that. You know, heal me of this and, and, uh, and help that person, help this person. And th those are wonderful and those have a, a good place in our prayer life. But, but what often is lacking is stopping long enough to listen. Just listen. Praying continuously does not necessarily mean you're talking continuously. It means you are having fellowship and communion with God. And so sometimes it is talking, and sometimes it is just listening, just being still and asking him to speak to your hearts. So pray continuously. Lord, teach us to pray. Number one, it doesn't come naturally or necessarily conveniently. Pray, number two, continuously, which means it's not just a destination. It's also a disposition. It should be ongoing way that we see our Christian lives. And then the third point, I'm drawing on two verses here out of Philippians 4, 6 and Luke 22, 42. Now, here's, here's the full verse, uh, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, actually. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, 
by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, now listen to that along with Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus, this is also in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now he's speaking about the cup of suffering, and it's, and it's J- Jesus is expressing. You know, look, he's fully God, but he's also fully man. There's, a, there's the, the wonderful mystery of, of the incarnation, God taking on human flesh. The humanity part of Jesus like any of us, would not want to experience excruciating agony and pain of a crucifixion. So Jesus is actually praying to his Father, if there's another means by which redemption of the world can be accomplished, and I don't have to experience this suffering, Lord, if you could take this cup from me, Father, then, then do it, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And I think it's important to remember that when you, when you take a look again at Philippians 4, 6 and Luke twenty two forty two 42, that prayer is presenting your request to God. That's Philippians 4, 6. But it is also about surrendering your will to his. Now, I hear Christians from time to time, and I just want to, you know, challenge this thinking. I hear Christians sometimes saying that your prayer life should really be about telling God rather than asking God. And it, and it comes across like, you know, just, and I know people mean well when they say these kind of things, but I hear this kind of nonsense in the body of Christ sometimes. And I hear people actually say things like, you just go in to prayer, just telling God and, you know, standing on your faith. And, and in a sense, I don't think they would necessarily use this word, but demanding from God what you want done. And you just claim it and you just say it and, and it'll be done for you. Listen, listen to me, listen to me, friends. It's okay to defer to the will of God. It's okay to defer to the will of God. I'll go so far as to say it's necessary that you defer to the will of God. I have heard some Christians say it's weak for Christians to close a prayer by saying your will be done. Uh, excuse me, but Jesus did it right here in Luke twenty-two forty-two. And he also did it again in Matthew chapter 6 when he taught the model of the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. There's nothing weak about saying, Lord, I want your will. What you're doing is you're surrendering your will to the greater will of the Father. You're making your request known. You're saying, Lord, I'm pouring out my heart. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. With thanksgiving, I'm making my, my prayers, my petitions, my requests known to you by supplications with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And the peace of God will, that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful benefit we get when we pray, that the peace of God just transcends our hearts and minds and guards us from the fear and the worry and the anxiety. His peace just comes all over us. So make your request known. Lift it up to the Lord. Tell him what you need. James warns us in James chapter 4, you have not because you ask not. Or you have not because you ask with wrong motives, is what James says to us. So ask. But we had better be willing to also say, but Lord, you know what's best. And you know far more than I know. And you can see far greater than what I can see. And because all I can see is this little, this little tiny part of life, as I pray and make my request known, if you have better intentions for me, then let your will be done, not mine. That is not a weak prayer, friends. That is acknowledging the sovereignty of your Father in heaven who loves you and the willingness to humble yourself enough to defer to the will of God. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's crucified, and he's saying, Father, I'm presenting my request to you. If you got another way to accomplish this besides the crucifixion, I really wouldn't like to suffer. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So we can pray that way, and it's okay. John would write in 1 John chapter uh, 5, verse 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God when we pray, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So don't discount the will of God in your prayer life. 
Uh, a lot of times we have this misunderstanding that prayer is about, you know, wanting God to kind of align with our will. That's not it, friends. It is getting to that place of such surrender that we have aligned our will with the will of God. So pray, make your requests known, but defer to the will of God and trust Him with the results. Amen? All right, now here's some quick things that remind us about uh, how important it is to God in terms of uh, when we pray to Him. Uh, just, and I'll just, I, I threw the whole list up there for you. Uh, God loves my persistence. Uh, Luke 18, this is a reminder in Luke 18, 1, this is when Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. That's what Luke 18, 1 says. And then it was the prayer, the parable rather of the persistent widow. So God loves it when we are persistent in prayer. Uh, point number two, God can handle my emotions. When you pray, go ahead and pour out. And I, I didn't even put a specific scripture reference. I just said Psalms. Because when you read through the book of Psalms, you see every kind of emotion. You see frustration, you see fear, you see worry, you see anger. There's times David's angry at God. God's a big God. He can take your anger. He can take your disappointments. He can take your fears. He can take your worries. He can take all kinds of emotion. And so God can handle all our emotions. Pour it out to him. He's a big God. God honors humility. In Jeremiah 29, 10 to 13, this is the promise that Jeremiah gave to the people of Israel when they were being taken off into captivity to Babylon for 70 years. It was God spanking. Remember when he spanked the people of Israel because of their idolatry, sent them to Babylon for 70 years? But the prophet Jeremiah gave them hope and he said to them in chapter 29, 10 to 13, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call upon me. Then you will call upon me. See, after they had been humbled, then they will call upon him and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Also, point number four on the list, God welcomes my burdens. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened. King James says heavy laden when you have the, just feeling this weight on you in life and I will give you rest. And God wants my trust. In Acts 12, verse 5, it talks about how Peter had been arrested and thrown in prison. But Acts 12 says, Acts 12, 5 says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. They trusted God. Like, Lord, he's in prison. He's one of our brothers. We're going to trust you. God wants us to trust him in our prayers. And in that case, uh, God miraculously delivered Peter from prison as well. Let's move on then to this last section I want to just uh, touch on briefly, which is our communication with others, having to do with our witness. Notice again in verse 5, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Now, I want to uh, just comment on that word outsiders, uh, if you'll circle that in your Bible. Um, New King James says, those who are without. It's not a disparaging term, but it's just simply saying there are some outside the church. There are some outside the faith. There are some who, who are without. They don't know Christ as their Savior. Uh, they don't pretend to know Christ as their Savior. And they're living life like anybody does who doesn't know Christ as their Savior. And Paul's got some instruction here in verses 5 and 6 about how we are to conduct ourselves in relation to those who don't know Christ. But I want you to notice here two words. He says, be wise in the way you act. Circle that. Some of your translations say walk. It's the Greek word peripateo. It's the way that you live out your life. It's the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Verse 6, let your conversation, circle that word, be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So in your Bible, circle the word act and circle the word conversation, because I think that's one of the important points about our witness, that it is about action and conversation. It's about how we live and what we say. People in general are not interested in what you have to say until they first can observe your life. You know, developing the respect to speak into somebody's life takes a little bit of time for you to be observed that you are respectable. And so our witness is not just what we say, it's how we live. It's our conduct. 
That's why he says here, be wise. Be wise about how you act. Be careful with your conversation because it is both how we conduct ourselves and what we say that will make an impact in terms of our witness. It will either make for a witness or it will blow our witness. You say, well, I'm not sure I, I like to be always so, you know, reminded of this. Well, we need to be reminded of this. Uh, someone once said that you might be the only Bible somebody ever reads. You, you are a living, walking ambassador for Christ and a good ambassador always represents properly that government that he or she is sent from, right? So like an ambassador from a foreign country is always kind of on display representing that government or that president or that prime minister from the country that he or she was sent. And so it is as Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ. Our lives are on display and wherever we go, how we act and what we say is representing Christ, either a good representation or a bad representation. But you will be demonstrating something by the way you act and what you say. The other thing that he mentions here that I think is an important reminder to us is that it's about looking for opportunities to represent Christ because he says there, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Have you ever prayed and asked the Lord to give you opportunities to share your faith? When you do, you'll be surprised at the doors that open. It'll be startling to you. I, I dare you. No, I double dare you. No, pray and ask the Lord, Lord, give me opportunities to share my faith. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at how suddenly people will start asking you or having conversations with you and the doors that'll be open for you to be able to share your faith. Look for those opportunities, pray for those opportunities. But listen, don't feel the pressure that you have to close the deal, all right? You know, some people get the idea that if, if, I, if I start to share my faith, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on the metro with somebody, I don't have enough time to share my faith in five minutes because my stop is coming up. So I just won't say anything. That's what we tend to do. Uh, and, and, and yet, what the important thing for us to do is to take advantage of every opportunity because as we're reminded in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, you know what, I planted the seed. And one of his fellow missionary companions, Apollos, he said, Apollos would often water the seed. And he said, but God is the one who gives the increase. And so Paul says, look, I worked very well with Apollos. Sometimes I would just plant the gospel. I would just get the idea going. I'd plant the seed. Apollos would come along, he'd water it, but God's the one that caused it to grow and bear fruit. So your job, my job is not to get somebody saved. Okay, you and I don't have the power to get somebody saved. That's, that's up to God. Our responsibility is sometimes to plant the seed. Sometimes just to plant the seed, just to drop, you know, to start to drop a little seed of, of a conversation about Christ. Tell your story a little bit. You don't, you don't have to get them to recite the four spiritual laws and pray right there on Metro. Could you bow your, your head now and kneel here and as the Metro is coming to its stop and then, and then you hear doors opening, hurry, pray the prayer. Doors opening, hurry. You don't have to seal the deal. Sometimes it's just you plant and God has a wonderful way of bringing someone else into that person's life to water it, come along after you, and then God's the one that gives the increase and God's the one that causes people to get saved. Last thing that's important to be reminded about here that he mentions in verse six is that it's about speech that is full of grace, seasoned with salt and ready to answer everyone. Now, I love the way he talks about grace here, seasoned with salt, because grace is the love part and salt is the truth part. See, because one of the properties of salt is it serves to be like an antiseptic. It stings. You get salt in a wound, it stings, but it has healing properties to it, so it's working. But what he's saying here is I want, I want our speech to be, seized, he said, full of grace, full of grace, okay? Seasoned with salt, just a sprinkle, all right? Full of grace, just a sprinkle of salt. You, you dump too much salt on something, nobody wants it. 
You can turn anything good into something terrible with too much salt, but just enough to flavor it. Oh, now it's delicious. Delicious. So what he's reminding us is when you are sharing about the Lord or you're talking to someone about your faith, you know, don't go in there with both barrels loaded. Don't start confronting them about their lifestyle. Do you know how this is displeasing to God? Do you know how, you know, sinner, there's a word for you, sinner. <laughs> Why don't you just go in softly, full of grace, and season it with salt? You know, bring truth into it, but don't dump a whole boatload of salt onto it because you'll make it unpalatable. Season it with salt. In John 1.17, the Bible says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We can't be about the law. We can't be heavy on the law. We have to be full of grace, seasoned with salt, and then be ready to give an answer. And that's what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I love the way Peter says that in 1 Peter 3.15, and I love the way that Paul says this here in Colossians 4.6, because the inference is, when he speaks here about being ready to answer everyone, the inference is that our lives should be lived in such a way that it causes people to ask us questions. You don't necessarily have to be confrontational with grace and truth. Our lives should be saying something to people that they look at us and say, I want something that you have and I don't know what it is. Be ready to give an answer to people who ask the question. What, what is it about you? What's different about you? What, why, why, why is your life like it is? And why do you go to church? And how come your kids and your marriage and how come this and that seem to be different from mine? What, what do you have? Live your lives in such a way that it creates an atmosphere of people wanting Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this reminder to us that we need to be people of prayer. And we also need to be people who are mindful of our witness. Lord, may we seek your face. May we be more disciplined in our prayer life to spend time with you in communion and fellowship in conversation, both speaking and listening. And may we live our lives in such a way that it will cause people to ask us questions. And it'll be a very natural open door to giving answers to everyone who asks us. And may people see Jesus in us, Lord. We know that we're not perfect. There will be times that we are an embarrassment to ourselves and an embarrassment to you. But thank you for your grace. And help us, Lord, to be mindful that what we say and how we live our lives can be a reflection of you. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We thank you for your inspiration through the pen of Paul. And we take the book of Colossians to heart. We give you praise and thanks and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.